the 15th Sunday after Trinity. Just a few announcements that I have for you. Our midweek Holy Communion service, which I started last week, continues this week in Scarwa. I'm doing the whole month of September over in Scarwa at half past ten on Thursday morning. So if you're welcome to come to that half hour communion service just on Thursday morning, if you're free, you're more than welcome through that. Also on Thursday will be a meeting of the Select Vestry here in the church at half past seven. And if you know of any members who are not here, please do contact them. Next Sunday is the third Sunday of the month and we're having our monthly family service. Be a bit more light-hearted service and I encourage you to come along and if you know of other families, do please, do please ask them to come along. They should enjoy it. I, I enjoy them. <laughs> Maybe that's just my warped sense of humour, but I enjoy them. But please do come along for that more light-hearted service as we join to worship God as a family. Those are all the announcements that I have for this week, and we make them in God's will. Some words of scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Our opening hymn is hymn number 643, Be Thou My Vision, and we're omitting verse 2 and 3.
gives all who truly repent. Have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goods. And keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouth proclaim your praises. O Lord, we speak to save us. O Lord, we speak to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be forever. Amen. The Lord's name be praised. Psalm for today is Psalm 19, verses 1 to 8. And we read in the current town verses. The heavens are telling the glory of God. And, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. One day pours out its soul to another. And one night unfolds knowledge to another. They have neither speech nor language. And their voices are not heard. Yet their sound has gone out to all the lands. And their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. That comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber, and rejoices as a champion to run his course. It goes forth from the end of the heavens and runs to the very end again. And there is nothing in him from the sea. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statues of the Lord are right and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and gives light to the eyes. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and shall be forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is taken from the Mark chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 27. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples were gone to the villages around Caesarea and Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my works in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning our Bible reading was sort of boiled down to, I'm going to be looking at a wee bit later, is our failures. We seem to fail at some things we do. I was looking to try and find something to illustrate that, and I come across this.
<laughs> we, 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 we tend to do things and do things over and over again and never learn. We seem to fail and do things. That guy was trying his best by his own strength to get up back onto that podium and he should be ducking and he should be jumping over it. But he wasn't succeeding because he was trying to do it on his own. It's the same with our life. If we try to succeed on ourselves, we will fail. But we, if we have Christ with us, living in our lives, he will help us. He will be there to encourage us, to get us back up on the podium, to get us back in the winning side. Not like this guy who keeps going by himself and keeps getting knocked over. We will, at certain points in life, even as Christians, we will fall. But with Christ, we can get back up again. So whenever we look at things like that, that guy was falling all the time because he was trying it in his own strength. We will fail it ourselves on our own strength. But whenever we have Christ with us, that will make all the difference for us. So let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can trust in you. We thank you that we can come to you for help. Whenever we do fall, whenever we do fail, we know that you are still there with us. So be with us. Strengthen us, give us the strength that whatever situations we face, that you will be with us, that you will guide us, and that you will help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In this time, stand together and reaffirm our faith in the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We say the, the prayer that our Lord Jesus, our Saviour, told us. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and grant her government with her. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. And let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people. And bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And let your glory be over all the earth. O God, may clean our hearts within us. And renew us by your Holy Spirit. The poet for today, the 15th Sunday after Trinity. God, in whose generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit, upon your church in the burning fire of your love. Grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you may be found steadfast in faith and active in service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the calling morning prayer. As we say together, O God, the author of peace, and lover of God, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is a perfect freedom. Defend us in all the souls of our enemies, that we, spiritually trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together, O Lord, the heart of our Heavenly Father, Almighty and ever living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. 
Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you and all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a prayer that Christ may be revealed to you always. Christ be with me. Christ behind me. Christ before me. Christ beside me. Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in parts of all that love me, Christ in wrath, friend and stranger. Amen. Prayers in the midst of everyday life. O Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You mark out my journeys and my resting place, and are acquainted with all my ways. Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders, that we may serve you with reverence, and know your peace at our life's end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer in the busyness of life. Lord, you are ever watchful and bless us with your gifts as you provide for all our needs. So help us to build only what pleases you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the benefits that you have won for us, for all the pains and insults that you have borne for us. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more dearly, day by day. Amen. And a prayer for those in grief, mourning, in faith and trust, believing in Christ, and for no, for those with no faith at all. A little prayer of thought for those who grieve and mourn. Those we love don't go away. They walk beside us day by day. Unseen, unheard, but always near. Still loved, still missed, and forever dear. Amen. And a little prayer for a child and some children with us this morning. Lord Jesus, bring your guard and guide me through the busy hours of day, and will your love be close beside me in the darkness when I pray. Amen. And we sum up all our prayers and gather them up together as uh, we say the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Stand now to sing our second hymn of the morning, hymn 112. There is a Redeemer, hymn 112. <laughs>
hear, learn, and put into practice what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Judging by your reaction to the video from a wee bit earlier, we all love to watch programs such as You Being Framed and It Will Be All Right on the Night. We have a habit of taking pleasure in other people's misfortunes, particularly when whatever happens to be, what happens comes as a complete surprise. When there's no injuries, it's all simply good fun. It gives us a laugh and makes us feel good especially when no one is hurt. The thing that makes it funny is that it could happen to any of us, but in some cases the people involved never learn. If something did not work, they keep doing it in the same way of hoping for a different outcome. In our passage today, Jesus is warning the people that they are not understanding the reason he has come to earth. Jesus had been doing many different things so far in Mark's Gospel. People were healed, miracles took place, parables were told, and Jesus taught in many unusual places. All these things, you would imagine, would have been pointing the people towards the true and real identity of who he was. Today we're going to be looking at three different areas which are conveniently divided up in our Bibles. Each looking at different areas of failing in our walk with God. No one likes to be told that they have failed. But it is only through knowing we are going in the wrong direction that we can redirect ourselves into the path that is right for us. I can remember a time in my former life as a van driver, turning and driving in the wrong direction and knowing after a fairly <coughs> fairly noticeably short time that I was going in the wrong direction. I had to turn around and go in the right direction if there was any chance of me getting to my proper destination. We are born until we turn our lives around. We are going in the wrong direction. We are born into sin and the only way out of that is through the work of the Holy Spirit in us, pointing us towards Jesus Christ as Lord over our entire lives. First we come to a very strange question. If someone we know were talking about were talking about asking their friends what sort of person do people say they are or what are they calling them? I'm sure your reaction would be, although you might not come out and say it, but it could be something like, who does he think he is? Or he's getting much more important than he really is. It's never a pleasant conversation to have. And we must be careful not to be falling into the trap of promoting ourselves higher than we are or we need to be. Jesus asked the question to the disciples not to catch them out, but in a way to put things straight. Because of that, Jesus was doing, because of what Jesus was doing the people were starting to produce all different ideas of who he could be. You know the way it is. Even today, people produce all sorts of conspiracy theories. They hear something, and by the time it reaches the person who needs to hear it, the original message is totally obscured, that it is not recognisable. That was evident in this passage. Some were saying that Jesus was John the Baptist, Elijah or one of the prophets. While on the face of it, it seemed to be a compliment, but in fact, it was an insult. Jesus is the Son of God, and here he is being compared and likened to mere human beings, as John and Elijah were. The people got it wrong and failed in their assessment. Surprisingly enough, Peter, one of the disciples, stood up and addressed Jesus and got it right, which is not which is really unusual for him. Normally he would put his mouth in the gear before engaging his brain. But this time he was right. Obviously Jesus did not feel that the time had come for people to know his true identity and ask the disciples to keep quiet. 
So here we have the people failing in recognising who Jesus was. Secondly, we have the disciples failing Jesus. For some people, they might think that it was only Peter, but I believe it was all of them. It just happened to be that Peter was the spokesperson. Jesus was pointing out to the disciples that for salvation to come, the Son of Man has to go through four things. Number one, he must suffer. Number two, he must be rejected. Number three, he must be killed. And number four, he will rise again. It's not something that Jesus was looking forward to, as we know from the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he pleaded with his Father to remove the cup of pain that was before him. We are told that Jesus spoke plainly, therefore, leaving the disciples in no doubt about what was to take place. In the previous few verses, we have Peter standing up for Jesus and calling him the Messiah. And now we have him back to his usual self, in that he put his foot in it again. You can just imagine the shock that must have fallen through the disciples. Their friend and master, whom they had left everything for, was now telling them that he was going to suffer an unbelievable pain and that he was going to die. We are told that Peter took Jesus aside and went back down to rebuke him. You know the way. That will never happen. Stop talking like that. But Jesus knew the truth and the disciples didn't. I wonder, do we put ourselves in the situation of the disciples or do we accept? Well, we all know the events that happened in Jesus' life. Are we prepared to accept that Jesus, what Jesus was and that he has given his life so that we can live? Or do you think it is a fairy story? Obviously, since you're here, you have a certain element of faith that Christ suffered for each of us. Before giving a response to Peter, Jesus looked at all the disciples who were most likely agreeing with him. But he didn't. But we can't be certain. Peter tended to be the one who would have spoken on their behalf. So it is commonly thought that in this passage they were all in agreement. Jesus looked at them and then turned to Peter and to, to answer his statement by saying, Get behind me, Satan. Now I need you to get one thing straight. Jesus was not calling Peter Satan, but that he was talking like Satan would, trying to get people to discourage them and us from obeying God. It was the words that Peter used caused the problem and could be described as satanic. I wonder, are we like the disciples, failing in our words when it comes to speaking for Jesus? Do we take a stand or do we just sit in the background? Thirdly, Jesus is not only talking to those around him, but he is also talking to each of us. We have those famous words. Words that have been known now for a couple of millennia, from verses 34 to 38. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when, it comes, when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Those verses give us a stark warning. I want you to notice the words, he called the crowd along with the disciples. This message was not what this message was for everyone present at the time, and it is for all of us here and now. It is not for the select few, but for everyone. We all have a duty, and we all need to respond in the correct way to what Jesus wants for each of our lives. 
We need to be denying ourselves and follow Christ. We might think that we can do all things by ourselves, but that is far from the truth. The world tells us to look out for yourself. Focus on the focus on what you think is good, and you and everything will be fine. Yes, it might give you a pleasant life while you're here on this earth, but remember that we are only here for a very short period of time in the grand scheme of things. Jesus here is not saying that gaining things is wrong. Life will need to continue. But the most important item you need is to have your soul ready and willing to meet with the Lord. You can have everything, but if you don't have that personal relationship with God, at the end of the day, you have nothing. When we deny Christ, we are more or less saying that we are ashamed of Him. And in verse 38, Jesus says that if you are ashamed of Him, He will be ashamed of you when you stand before him on the day that we die. Let us not be a people that are faith in Christ. Let us not be a people who want everything our own way, but let us be a people who are putting Jesus first in our hearts. Let us be willing to be open to what God wants us to do, and let us be willing to proclaim him in all situations that we find ourselves in. To do all that, we need to be learning more about Jesus. We should be putting him first in our lives. As I said, there is nothing wrong with having material things. We need them to live, but it's when they take over our lives and God is pushed out, that is when the trouble starts. We need to be careful. As I said, we need to be putting Jesus first and then when our time on this earth is over, Jesus will not be ashamed of us and will welcome us into his kingdom forever and ever. The alternative is too ghastly to think about. So I'm urging you not to, or I'm urging you to put Christ first in your life and then to reap the benefits that that will provide for you. stand together to sing our final hymn of this morning's service, hymn number 605. Will you come and follow me? Hymn 605 and we will be admitting verses 2 and 4.
and forevermore. Amen. So we go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.